Hey everybody, uh, David Reddy here. <laughs> uh, I'm here uh, to present along with Sandra Nielsen and Scott Crosby on the uh, perspectives and lessons learned with the HTC Exemplary Buildings Program today. Sandra Nielsen uh, is Director of Facilities, Man of Facilities and Asset Management and DSC. Uh, Scott Crosby is a Senior Associate and Project Manager at Ingram Moisson Architects and myself, David Reddy, I'm the Building Performance Group Principal at O'Brien 360. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is a, a background on the exemplary buildings program. If you haven't heard about it, it's uh, an HTC initiative to, to uh, uh, build high performance buildings that, that uh, balance a number of uh, attributes and, and challenges that we experience in affordable housing. Um, I introduced everybody earlier. Sandra is representing today the owner operator perspective, Scott, the architect perspective, and myself from a, as a consultant uh, focused on building performance. And at the end, I'm also going to give a, an update on the uh, what we call the exemplary building demonstration projects. Um, again, if you haven't heard about them, it's a, it's a group of projects that we focused on early on to, to demonstrate and apply the principles that we were seeking to advance. Um, to give everybody the context that this idea kind of was spawned out of, um, we, we all know that we have both an affordable housing crisis and at the same time, a, a climate crisis. And, and that affordability is, is compounded by uh, an equity crisis and that it doesn't affect uh, all people the same. <clears throat> and so with that challenge in mind, um, the, the exemplary building uh, task force, the group of people who set out to build this program kind of recognized from the very beginning the competing uh, interests and, and challenges that, that all the groups involved in developing these buildings have uh, from housing developers uh, needing to deliver units and control costs, uh, asset and property managers that that uh, need to maintain these buildings once they're put into operation and, and make sure they can be um, uh, cared for without a lot of extra cost. And then also our, our community and societal um, uh, challenges and, and uh, at, things that we need to keep in mind with respect to uh, changing codes, um, the climate crisis I mentioned, and, and also uh, you know, serving everybody's needs uh, as best we can. One of the things when we started back in 2019 was recognizing that we were, on, we were gonna be moving on a trajectory towards an exemplary building anyways. We, codes at the state level are, are moving at uh, an accelerated rate to achieve a 70% reduction by 2030. So this is in the context of new buildings, both commercial and residential. And then within Seattle, um, uh, goals to be carbon neutral as well, which, which translates to an even more aggressive uh, energy code in, in Seattle. Um, and so we recognizing these challenges, um, we knew that um, we had, uh, when I say we, the collective owners, architects, developers, everybody involved in building these, these projects, um, recognize that we're on this trajectory, we should try and figure out how to get there without compromising the number of units, building quality buildings uh, that, that will last a long time and still meet these goals, uh, these energy performance goals and other challenges that we have in mind. And, and that trajectory looks, it's, it's a steep curve and in all aspects of the energy use of buildings has to be reduced. And then we need to generate energy as well using PV. Um, so with that context in mind, the exemplary buildings program was, was spawned. And, and uh, it was uh, the, the exemplary building task force, the group of people involved in, in the effort kind of brainstormed a number of different subject areas that we wanted to focus on uh, developing, uh, trying to uh, gather the collective thoughts and, and um, best ways, uh, best practices in, in a number of different areas so that we could document them, distribute them, train on them, and, uh, and 
collectively bringing everybody along as best we can in, in achieving these goals. So they centered around early integrative design, um, uh, exterior wall assembly, knowing that most of the building, the exterior walls make up a very large chunk of the cost and, uh, and uh, energy use that, uh, for heating that we focused on how to build better walls. Um, domestic hot water is, is probably the largest energy use in, in these buildings. So we focused, wanted to focus on that, not only hot water, but also distribution, sizing of pipes um, and, and management or metering. Uh, balanced ventilation and heat recovery uh, was, was a topic that back in 2019 was, oh, this is coming, it's gonna be in the code. Um, how do we do it? You know, this, this is the, in my opinion, the biggest change in the code and how we're going to be building buildings from here forward in, in commercial code. And then also integrating solar into buildings, how to, how best to do that. Uh, and then two final topics that we weren't able to focus on much in the last couple of years, but, but hope to, especially operations next year, is um, the operations and, and healthy buildings. By healthy buildings, focusing on materials and uh, ways to improve indoor air quality and make the, um, the buildings healthier places to live. So with these topics in mind, um, we, we set out to some goals, um, kind of in buckets of time, starting back in 2019, to, um, to develop um, a set of goals and, and specifications that we wanted, um, we engaged owners on and, and asked for early commitment to uh, in, uh, in exchange for participating and supporting them in building their projects and, and achieve, uh, pursuing additional utility incentives and grant support. Um, the goal being with respect to energy, uh, having a building performance that's less than 20 EUI. EUI is like a miles per gallon for buildings, if you're not familiar with that term. Um, and uh, it's a metric that we we tend to judge these buildings on, but 20 is, is uh, low. It's, it was ex at that time, uh, roughly 50% less than 2015 uh, state energy code and less than 40% of the Seattle energy code. So very aggressive targets. Um, and, and part of that early owner commitment, I mean, there was actually an, uh, a letter that owners signed to participate um, you know, and in exchange, the team, the task force supported them by pursuing additional utility incentives, uh, grants, uh, wherever we could help with design support, um, uh, sharing lessons learned. And, and part of that commitment did uh, translate to what we're talking about today. We're sharing this information to the community on what was learned, um, you know, from cost to performance uh, and design information. So. I see it as an extremely valuable and unique uh, contribution to this area. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud to be part of it as, as I think we all are. Um, the, <clears throat> the, the approach here is kind of in a flow idea. We, we drafted targets and when I say targets, it's along the lines of that 20 EUI goal. Um, but there also was a list of, of what we called our specifications um, and high level goal requirements like being an all electric building, uh, uh, building walls to um, an R22 overall performance or using heat pump water heating. Those were all things that were encapsulated in, a, in what we call our targets or recommendations document. We drafted them as what we thought was a, the right balance for achieving that goal. We hosted charrettes. Uh, Th long three hour meetings with a lot of people, a lot of smart people to kind of uh, identify the challenges in each of the subject area and the solutions. Uh, we, we host, we took that information, we, we presented it as a series of workshops um, and we had a guidelines document. We're working on guidelines documents now for some of them, some of them are out and those are gonna be uh, informing. We're gonna use that information to inform and continue to refine our, our our targets, along with uh, future training in building, actually building these buildings. The, the progress to date includes, so this kind of summarizes in each of those buckets. Um, you know, we had our charrettes back mostly in 2020. Uh, <clears throat> we, um, we, we developed design guidelines uh, for uh, 
uh, early integrated design or EID and wall assembly. We, one of the highlights is, uh, um, I have these switched actually. The draft of the balanced ventilation with heat recovery is due out this month in October and the water heating next month. So those are probably the biggest uh, pieces to be completing the, our guidelines uh, series. Um, these are documents, you know, 10 to 20 pages long uh, with a lot of resources and information from this work. And then we completed our workshops and we'll, we have a couple of trainings planned for later this year that uh, HTC is, is uh, sponsoring uh, in these areas. And operations were, is a focus for 2022. Um, all right, and here are the demonstration projects. There are five in the cohort. Uh, the range in, in, um, in they're all mid-rise buildings, are all built under the commercial codes, various developers, um, some of uh, whom have, are presenting today on these projects. Uh, I know Skipta and that team presented this morning. Um, they're mostly in Seattle. There's one project uh, uh, being developed by Imagine Housing up in Bothell. Um, a, a great range of different building types or, and, and populations that live in them, um, you know, and ranging from permanent supportive housing to, to family and senior housing. And um, right now, uh, Hobson Place, uh, by, uh, being built by BSC, is, is on track to be completed by the end of this year, and the, and the other projects start being construction next year. And, and just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge um, a number of key, you know, this couldn't happen without these people and, and the support of these organizations. Um, you know, first and foremost, uh, Marty Koistra at HTC, uh, who, who really his vision and leadership to keep this going and, and um, you know, make sure we, we kind of kept our sights on the goals and just a, a ton of support over the years. Uh, it really would not be happening without Marty and, and the support from Lauren and Nathan and all the HTC staff. Uh, Mark Deutsch um, has been volunteering with uh, the task force for a number of years now, providing excellent project management, facilitating meetings, and really, this would all fall apart without Mark. Uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of volunteer hours by the people on the task force. The EV task force is a group of uh, developers, owners, uh, consultants, uh, architects that have all contributed their knowledge over the years. And also, um, Grants and incentives provided by Seattle City Light. Uh, Commerce, not, we weren't uh, coordinated with Commerce, but they, through their UHE program, the ultra high efficiency grant program they had, it really was a catalyst for some of these exemplary buildings as well. Uh, the Bullet Foundation and Edwards Mother Earth also providing financial support to make this happen. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Sandra to talk about uh, her exemplary building project. Thank you, David. Hi, I am Sandra Nielsen. I'm the Director of Development and Facilities for DESC. Uh, DESC predominantly provides permanent supportive housing for individuals that are 30% average median income and below. We have 1,400 units. Um, we also have a lot of clinically based programs that provide a lot of support for clients that are living in their units. Um, the building that is participating in the exemplary building program is Hobson Phase Two, named after the late great Mr. Bill Hobson. So it's sentimental for, to me for a lot of different reasons. It'll be 92 permanent supportive housing units. The um, project team here that helped make this building possible, Lotus Development, Runberg Architecture, Rushing Mechanical, and Walsh is our general contractor. We are heavily charging towards a December occupancy date. Um, everyone loves to house people by the end of the year or the beginning of the year. It's a great time of year for that. So um, I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit of the specifics about the Hobson being um, both passive house and an exemplary building. We kind of had a late decision to pursue it really when we realized that the Commerce Yuki money that David mentioned was available and that we 
we kind of were hearing that maybe not a lot of people were positioned to go into the rounds. So we, um, you know, the Lotus team worked very hard to generate an application for that. And we were um, successfully mm -hmm. awarded money. We also have Edel City Light money in it. Um, I think it's also important to note that DESC had been working towards this path. Um, we had definitely seen shifting energy code dynamic. And also um, we had been doing a lot of analysis of some of our buildings as they were aging. And to say that they were real energy, you know, not great is an understatement. We had a lot of buildings that we were spending thousands and thousands of dollars a year on water and power and gas. And, you know, with those um, subsidy resources for permanent supportive housing being so scarce, it just really was obvious that we needed to move towards more energy efficient buildings, not only from that perspective, but also, you know, it's really important that there's equity and who gets energy efficiency, that it's not just the super rich that can afford to put solar panels on, but that it's for everyone, you know, energy equity is for everyone. So, you know, our building, starting with our Estelle building that's been in service for a few years, we'd already moved to an ERVs and we've long had centralized systems. So all of the kind of foundation was there to really kind of push the envelope a little bit to get to Passive House. Um, we're also seeing that some of DESC's longtime donors and foundations were kind of motivated about energy efficiency, and we definitely felt like there was avenues there to pursue um, grant dollars. Look at this lovely ventilation system. We have a little bit different of a system in that we have a centralized system that has rooftop Swigon units that are serving the building through, um, you know, ducting that is in the plenum space near the roof. So, you know, that presented a lot of challenges of how to make that work with the roof envelope, how to, um, you know, not have single ERVs through shafts serving different units. So, um, you know, this um, design and system worked really well for this building. And um, I was personally very excited to try this week on units because, um, you know, what's interesting is I wear two hats in this role. I manage property development and I also manage our facilities department. And when I saw the Swigon unit and how simplistic it was, I became very motivated about our ability to manage that with in-house resources for maintenance and upkeep. And that is part of my excitement about this system and how it's laid out. Here are some photos of how this works, a um, kind of 3D model and a photo of the actual installation at Hobson. Um, you can kind of see how the, the lines work from the rooftop into the building. Wow, look, that is so exciting. Um, I think that, you know, figuring out how this all fit in this very tight space was really challenging and exciting. And also figuring out how to really make this system airtight. I think, you know, as you can see here, Walsh did just an amazing job on the installation. There's a subcontractor that did all the work. And there's just a lot of penetrations here that you need to seal in the shaft with the fire reading. So, um, you know, tight fit, but it, it's in there, it's very exciting. Here is the roof of Hobson and the other exciting side benefit of this centralized ducting system is look at how much solar we were able to fit on there. And, you know, Seattle City Light has been such a great partner to us and getting all of this solar on the rooftop is, is really exciting on a lot of, if you were to look at Estelle's, DESC Estelle's roof, the, the ERVs when they're in the shaft configuration take up a lot of space and there's a lot of them. And you don't have as much room or potential for solar that you do in this configuration. And that was part of 
um, you know, the excitement about it. And I'm going to pass to architect Scott Crosby with Ingram Moisom. He's going to talk about another exemplary building and the design challenges and features there. Thank you so much, Sandra. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Crosby. I'm a project manager with Ingram Moisom Architects. And I'm going to chat with you a little bit about the Seattle Housing Authority Sawara project, which is scheduled to start construction approximately mid-November, it might be early December. The project is located in the Yesler Terrace redevelopment area, as shown in the yellow highlight on the slide on the, on the left, or on the right, excuse me. Next slide, it's on a relatively steep sloping site. Uh, there are 114 units of affordable family housing. Uh, the development team, a uh, great team uh, from starting with Seattle Housing Authority and uh, MARPAC Construction came on board. Um, everyone on this team, we had many roll up the sleeve work sessions, which I think were critical to achieving the goals of the exemplary building program at the best cost possible. Uh, the early design integration, as you'll see, was absolutely critical in getting everything to work together. You'll see the basic unit count. Uh, there's a fair amount of two and three bedroom units. Uh, next slide. David, next slide. Whoops. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Well, technology. I think we lost David. Yep. Does somebody else have this slideshow to bring it up? Give me a second. Wow. Um, just at the right time. Hold Just on. as you we were starting to talk about the exciting stuff. <laughs> Let me see what I can find. Hold on. I can uh, entertain any questions if there are any while we're waiting. Okay, so David sent an email. He is trying to restart. <clears throat> so while he's doing that, so Sandra, um, were you pleased with the, the ERB system um, selected? And were there any um, challenges to the other components of the, the building when the ERV was being designed and integrated into the project? Yes, I think shaft construction is really like the million dollar question that has to be figured out and how you're going to work it into the design. Um, we have the dynamic of all of our units, our studio apartments, and we have what's called a double loaded corridor, meaning that all the units are kind of on both sides of a corridor for maximum efficiency. So figuring out the shaft equation in that kind of building is a little bit easier than when you have family units where there's bedrooms and, you know, finding uniform shaft placements in the um, in the building. 
So I think that that's a challenge. Also, you know, when you're doing shaft construction, if you have a wood building and you're building shafts out of drywall, how to keep them airtight and fire rated is a expensive conundrum that has to be worked out. So I think there's kind of got pros and cons to the central approach versus ERVs in shafts on the roof and both have benefits and, um, you know, things that make them, you know, more or less a kind of valuable. There was a question in the chat about help that we got from Seattle City Light. So um, Seattle City Light really has been a super great partner for this. They, um, they helped us with the um, analysis, a lot of energy analysis has to go into um, to make sure that you're meeting the um, air barrier and the kind of you know mathematical equations to make sure that the building is going to be passive house. Seattle City Light helped with that, and they also have incentives for solar programs that um, Hobson um, South Bay was able to capitalize on. And so this is Mark until uh, uh, we get rejoined. I do want to mention that as part of the exemplary program, we had talked with City Light and they set up some special incentive grants that there were four projects were able to take advantage of. So Sandra's uh, building is the first one of those four. And all four of those opportunities have now been taken up. So some of the uh, incentives that Sandra is talking about are at least currently no longer available from City Light, and uh, it's their standard incentive programs that are still available. So, for instance, there is still, I believe, it's incentive funding for solar lighting that for solar energy that's still available. But the yeah, 20... I think it depends on your building, but um, Seattle City Light always has exciting stuff, regardless of the building. We've been able to utilize other Seattle City Light incentives for other DESC buildings, existing and new. So you kind of have to like meet with your the Seattle City Light coordinator that's assigned to your geographic area and talk about what's possible and talk about what you're, um, you know, kind of willing and able to do based on your building and the constraints. I see a, can somebody put the slide link in the chat? Let me see if I can do this. I'm sorry, are you aware that you have the talks on her? It's just, I, I'm just, it's just me. It's just me now. Um, so, um, just so Sherry's clear, we are waiting for um, David to rejoin. His computer went through a reboot process. So as soon as he's through that, and I guess I'm sorry that nobody else had actually posted the presentation somewhere so one of the, one of, the other of us could access it. Just want to invite people, if they have questions, to put them up in the chat. Good time to ask them. Well, if if I could share my screen, I think we could keep rolling. Okay, and Scott. I don't I don't have the full presentation, but I've got the next the next section. So let me give that a try. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Not yet, but we'll give it a little bit of a wait, 10 seconds, maybe. Okay. How about now? Nope. Mm. Do you have it up on your screen? You just need to share your screen. Oh, David's coming on board.
There's a question in the chat about, um, does any of the climate change issues or possibilities impact your planning for efficient system in a new affordable housing development? I can say that something that has been, um, you know, there's two kinds of concerns, at least for DESC's client population is, you know, as the summer temperatures get warmer, you know, typically in this environment, you don't provide cooling and the need for that, with, especially with elderly or frail populations is becoming greater. And also having systems that you can design freeze protection in for individuals with disabilities or mental illness who, who may be, you know, on a 20 degree day, leaving a window open and trying to, you know, consider all of those possibilities and opportunities balanced with the capital cost so that you, know, you can provide safe, efficient um, environments, but then also considering these dynamics. I also think that you know, gas-fired equipment is particularly problematic if you're doing central systems and you need um, you know, really high BTUs in your boiler system in order to provide the quantity uh, or to the be able to meet the load demand of the water. And um, you know, that's really, you're dependent then on people who have certain licenses and vendors that can do that. And that can really be expensive over the long term. David asked if he could be unmuted. David needs to do it. Can you, are you trying to unmute on your screen? Did you see the comment that the host is mm -hmm. blowing? No. no, it's. Okay. There um, we go. Yeah, really. Thank you. Sorry. Wow. Holy cow. That is impeccable timing for a software, <laughs> a firmware update. About... <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, so you all are done. <laughs> I can start uh, broadcasting the uh, PowerPoint here again. All right, where are we? We were on Sawara about the second slide. All right. Really apologize for that, everyone. All right, here we go. All right, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, but no deck. I... No deck? Okay, hold on. All right. Okay, all right. Thank you, David. Well, that was fun, I hope. Uh, Everyone is still with us. Uh, thank you for uh, your patience and us with our uh, ever-changing technology. Okay, so back to Seattle Housing Authority, uh, the development team, uh, all on the screen, but uh, really, really, really good chemistry and teamwork among all of us. Uh, early design integration is, was critical for us in achieving the goals of the exemplary building program at a, a reasonable cost. Uh, real quick here, you'll see the uh, number of two bedroom and three bedroom units, which is uh, fairly significant. David, next slide. Uh, this is the basic layout of the building. There's a typical upper, upper level floor plan on the right. Uh, this was designed so that <laughs> there could be a children's play area in the center with casual adult supervision. Uh, the gray areas represent bridges to let light and air into the space and allows for uh, kids play area. Uh, on the left in white, these are diagrams of our uh, 
uh, one bedroom units. Next slide, please. Okay, so an exemplary building, one of the fundamental items is energy performance, and that is related to the exterior building envelope. Uh, the more performance we can get out of that uh, building envelope at a reasonable cost, um, the better for it's easier on all of our MEP systems. How did we achieve this? Well, <clears throat> through a design charrette. Early on in the process, uh, MARPAC, our MEP, the RDH building envelope, O'Brien 360 energy uh, consultant, uh, structural, as well as acoustics. Uh, in this case, it was a Zoom meeting. And as we started to roll up our sleeves and look at the difference in examining between two by six studs at 16 inches on center with exterior insulation versus the two by eight at 24 inches on center, uh, in trying to determine which route to go, MARPAC had done some homework prior to the work session and they had some real concerns about the cost of the exterior insulation. It was an additional sequencing step and no matter how they tried to slice it or dice it, it was really the driver for more cost. So the team turned to looking at uh, a two by eight, it's typically referred to as advanced framing, 24 inches on center for a five story building. Uh, oftentimes this gets very challenging because of the load on the lower level uh, studs. And the trick here is to ensure that the stud cavities have sufficient insulation. We've all walked through our, our wood frame buildings during construction and we look at the exterior walls and uh, sometimes you go, wow, there are so many studs, we can't even see the insulation. So one of the primary elements that led us to have the, the two by eight, which is what we landed on without exterior insulation, was that the building was originally laid out on a two foot module. We just do, our firm does this as a matter of course uh, for any uh, affordable uh, project. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, again, on the left, we're really showing how we were able to reduce some of the load on the exterior wall. Uh, we also placed all our shear walls inboard so we would not have hold downs and the stud banks that hold downs take up in the exterior walls. Uh, this issue forced us to do really more detailing. Uh, on the right is a exterior corner detail, making sure that that would work structurally, as well as fill those cavities with an R31 blown in uh, insulation. Uh, next slide, please. And here again, this is just describing the two foot module. Um, <clears throat> and we had to do some work as far as our uh, rain screen system and the furring strips and the connections. Uh, the lower detail is showing how the window openings, not only are the windows on a two foot module, the, the window openings and how this kind of rippled through the entire building. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can start to see the development of placing the windows within the, the unit and the skin system to maintain with discipline, this two foot module. Uh, we did have a little shuffling to do. The zoning code has a blank wall um, section and a window disrupts a blank wall. Uh, the intention there is just to show uh, how much these systems are integrated. Next slide, please. Okay, this is really a, a summary slide uh, looking at the differences uh, see the exterior insulation line and the sequencing. That is really what, what was a big concern for us. Um, <clears throat> we did have some restrictions on the exterior walls. I don't know if they were restrictions as much as challenges, but we believe that the system we came up with 
uh, does have less cost uh, and will achieve our uh, 0.17 to 0.25 target air infiltration rating. Next slide, please. Okay, so balanced ventilation and heat recovery. As David was saying, the 2018 building code, group R2 occupancies do require this and the exemplary building had identified this. So I feel like we kind of got a head start um, on this. Balanced ventilation basically means that the units are getting the same amount of intake air and exhaust air continuously. Heat recovery is basically the exchange of heat energy and we'll show, I'll show some quickies on how that works. And as Sandra was mentioning, uh, all designers from the start uh, need to first step is, are we going to do a centralized or unitized system and how does this impact the entire design? Next slide, please. Okay, so this diagram uh, basically describes uh, the magic of the heat exchanger component. It's called an ERV energy recovery ventilator or heat recovery ventilator. But this is in a wintertime diagram. Uh, cold outside air comes in and it mixes with warm interior stale air that is being exhausted. So the heat energy from the exhaust air transfers into the air that's going into the unit. Next slide. Okay, so some very, very basic diagrams. There are several different centralized systems versus unitized systems. Uh, the centralized, uh, generally the heat exchanging element shown in yellow here is inboard, sometime they're on the roof. And as Sandra was saying, it comes down through the roof with shafts and then there's duct work in the corridor. And as Sandra was saying, there's quite a bit to coordinate and that picture uh, really explained that very, very well. The other option is a unitized layout. And from the beginning, Seattle Housing Authority for our project was very intrigued and really wanted to pursue the unitized layout. In this case, the heat exchangers uh, are much smaller and everything is self-contained. The system is self-contained within the unit. Next slide. Okay. So as we start to look at some of the the challenges of this system. One of the biggest is that we need a 10 foot separation between the intake and exhaust. So when you're in the Sharpie stage, this system would be very challenging for studio units or very thin units. A 14 foot studio unit, you would not be able to get this separation, which is critical. Um, duct routing, the soffits, uh, coordination with sprinkler lighting, joist depth, uh, all need to be taken into consideration. So the di diagram on the right shows the intake air in red coming in to uh, our heat exchanger slash ERV. Uh, we've mounted all of those uh, horizontal. We tried to get them vertical uh, the supplier saw that we had one duct that had a 90 degree bend and was very concerned about condensation. So how you fit these into the unit uh, is critically important. Uh, in our case, we also have ducts that run in soffits and run in the joist bay both. So the amount of coordination there has another impact. Uh, next slide, please. Oops. Okay. So on the left is the southeast building form of our project. The yellow on the left represent the locations of the ERVs. And they are relatively small. They're about 
nine inches deep by about 29 inches wide. Uh, however, the depth and the ceiling height, so many of our projects were trying to get density. The height is just absolutely critical. So um, in working that, we just have to make sure we put these in areas and get the height to be consistent. Next slide, please. Uh, just details that we had to do as far as insulation of the ductwork uh, for code requirements. Next slide. Uh, when you select this system, uh, one coworker said, wow, are we going to have Swiss cheese on the outside? Uh, the number of penetrations needs to be understood. And how does that begin to inform the building form, as well as how well those are detailed to stop air infiltration. Next slide, please. Okay, so kind of rushing through this a little bit, but um, lessons learned or to be learned, perhaps in two years from now or three years from now, I'd love to come back and really say, okay, this is what we targeted and these are, are the results. But some of the, the critical things were measurable results. We all needed something definitive to uh, have our design goals around. Team, 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 entire team, contractor, all your sub-consultants in one room at one time, absolutely critical. Um, use your Sharpie. The early system identification and early systems compatibility is so important. Uh, especially with the ERVs. And you can start to see from these diagrams the relationship between the two-foot grid and the duct routing of the ERVs. Uh, mine the module, uh, the two-foot module just absolutely saved us and uh, really, really was beneficial for cost and the insulation in the exterior walls. Let's see, ACE, adapt, change, embrace. Well, we experienced that with our, uh, our system here today. But there were so many instances uh, in our roll up the sleeve work sessions in which uh, one person would say, I'm not sure that's going to work. And we'd have to continuously reevaluate, come up with another idea, and that would ripple in. But the process to integrate all of these systems to get an efficient exemplary building at a reasonable cost, uh, it, it, we'll see. I, I hope it works. I hope it works well. And I look forward to doing this again in a few years to show the built results. And with that, I'll turn it back over to David. Thank you, Scott. Great. Uh, thanks for taking us through that, and Sandra as well. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about my perspectives working on these projects and also gathering information that we're uh, collecting on each of them. Um, so I've tried to distill down and compare how these, um, these demonstration projects uh, are similar or differ uh, across a number of different er uh, design attributes. And, um, you know, the, there wasn't a hard, fast set of requirements for them. In fact, we w somewhat encouraged different approaches uh, to achieving what in the end was, was a performance target of, of 20 UI or less, as I mentioned. Um, you can see that um, uh, for wood walls, the buildings used anywhere from two by six, uh, you know, kind of traditional framing to two by eight advanced, as, as Scott just talked about. Most of the projects are incorporating triple pane vinyl windows, um, a common theme, and, and using moderate glazing percentages. And uh, with the passive house projects, uh, using even uh, the lowest percentages. Uh, all achieving aggressive air leakage targets. Hobson and SAMA are pursuing a passive house certification. So uh, very extreme uh, low performance of so different uh, approaches to the air and weather barrier in those cases. Um, and then in dwelling unit ventilation, as Scott and Sandra have talked about, uh, the centralized options um, and the unitized, and, and we have a mix of those. And, and Othello was, was the first demonstration project and they had already baked in exhaust ventilation at that point, but um, they, they include uh, CO2 central hop, heat pump water heating. So all projects are utilizing heat pump water heating. And, and that's been an area we've learned a lot and seen a lot of uh, 
uh, new different designs and different equipment come to the market. So um, that 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 has advanced quite a bit through the last two years, um, and we see it being more com more and more common. All projects are in, including solar of various range uh, and sizes, and Seattle City Light has provided um, a generous incentive for the projects to to do as much as they can. Um, they're all generally were uh, under ESDS version three, uh, with um, uh, and as I mentioned, two projects are pursuing passive house certification as part of their UHE program commitments. Uh, the funding sources uh, that that the uh, teams were able to leverage along with the uh, assistance of the Exemplary Building Task Force was ranged from Seattle City Light, as, as Sandra mentioned, a very uh, a, a, an amazing incentive for these programs, uh, for these buildings to participate uh, around $4,000 per unit, four to $5,000 per unit. And then also UHE was, was critical. Um, in in the, perf the judgment of performance, we. We, it was all in the context of the 2015 Energy Code, which was in effect when we started, uh, except for SAMA, the modeling that has been done has been against the 2018 Energy Code, um, but they're all achieving um, uh, 20 EUI or less uh, based on the models that we have. Now, these are, are just focused on the residential dwelling units. Uh, so when we talk about these energy numbers, the, the dwelling units and the stairs and the corridors, not including uh, you know, the parking garage or other things that may be in a project. So these numbers are, are in isolation of, of those components. And they're all reducing uh, energy use dramatically, you know, 30, 35 to 40, 50 percent uh, compared to code and, uh, and saving a lot of dollars every, every year. Um, so overall, the, you know, the takeaways, and I, I gathered from, <laughs> Not being part of it, but hearing some of the comments that that the talk about balanced ventilation and heat recovery happening very early in schematic design being one of the critical takeaways from from doing this, that seems to be the most uh, challenging system to integrate, and um, and that's been a big focus for the the exemplary building task force to provide as much uh, uh, help and, and information as we can, and the guidelines will be forthcoming this month on that topic. Integrative design, extremely important to, uh, to you know, the entire team focused on the goals and working together. Uh, central heat pump water heating, it's a common theme through all of these. And, and they're the big, that's one of the biggest measures. That's the one that saves the most energy of all the things that these buildings are doing. Um, and it's, it's becoming more cost effective and more pretty straightforward to integrate into designs as far as I can tell. It's just a cost thing. Uh, um, there's some space challenges and equipment challenges, but it, it's becoming much more mainstream since we started this program. Uh, and, and the resources, I want to emphasize, there's a website for the Exemplary Buildings Program. Uh, I can share this slide deck. We'll put, we're actually going to post it to our, to the, at the link up above uh, at the top, and we have links here to the uh, guidelines um, or the charrette uh, decks that have a lot of the images that we show today and use and, and our contact info. And with that, mm -hmm. thank you all for bearing with us through these technical difficulties. Um, I think we have one minute left. You wanna take a question? First. Let's see. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. In chat. Claire, Claire, are you still monitoring that? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm monitoring chat. Okay. Well, if I apologize, everybody. Go ahead, Claire. Oh, I was just going to say, if, if we are wrapping up here, I just want to mention that after this, um, in a, this event, there's an opportunity to meet with our Friends of Housing, of, Friends of Housing Award winners. And it, may, it isn't in like the actual program that it's on the online program, but it isn't on the website. So I just want to make sure that people are aware of that. And um, we did just get a question from Sherry about why um, Seattle Housing Authority was interested in the in-unit ERV versus the centralized system. So 
if somebody would like to answer that. Great question. Um, a couple of years ago, the, the leadership um, partially has changed at SHA and the previous design development uh, director um, had studied the different systems. And this was probably three years ago now. And um, there's challenges with both. Um, but my understanding is that at the time um, to the this design director at SHA that the centralized systems uh, had more complexities. Um, and then there's always the balance between operations, um, <clears throat> how the systems versus centralized versus unitized. If something happens in a unitized, it's only in that unit. Um, if there is something that really goes amiss in the centralized systems, does that take the entire wing down or that larger portion of the building? So um, we'll see. Um, but at the time, our owner was very much, no, we're, we're moving forward with unitized. No more questions. Feel free to reach out if we didn't cover anything or you had something you wanted to follow up on. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, like I said, I'll post the um, the uh, <clears throat> slide deck to the exemplary building website uh, here shortly. And uh, if you go to the website, there's uh, under our work, um, is a lot of these resources that I mentioned. Um, so uh, just Google exemplary building program and go to our work. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out with questions. Claire, do you want to wrap this up? Quite, quite a good example of being on our feet and uh, just shifting. Wow. Yeah, I'm sorry about that.